any of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Good day, superhumans. It's Boomer Anderson here, bringing you another episode of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. So with this podcast, you and I are on an adventure. We're out to decipher the world of health because frankly, there's a lot of crap out there. What we want to separate is crap from really true science-based information and to give you bite-sized pieces of just actionable information to make you more epic. 2018, let's talk a little bit about that real quick. 2018 has been a year where I've focused on my rhythms. Now, before I get into that, let's just say that I'm not the most musically inclined person, so I'm not really talking about musical rhythms. What I'm referring to is biological rhythms, and I've done quite a bit of studying on this myself, but today's guest studies it full time. Her name is Azur Grant. So Azur Grant is an editor at Quantified Self and a young researcher in the field of biological rhythms. Her goal is to combine chronobiology and participant-led research using wearable sensors and signal processing to map individuals' biological rhythms in the real world. The broader implications of that, if you think of it, are pretty awesome. So Azur and I got to know each other through a program called Blood Testers, which is a participatory quantified self project, which created the highest temporal resolution lipid data set ever recorded in free living humans. Some of her other research includes generating continuous body temperature data to investigate sleep, jet lag, and female cycling. We'll get into what some of those terms mean in this podcast, but some of the topics that we cover and I found very interesting are what are biological rhythms and how are they useful for everyday workplace performance. We talk about temporal structures, how those differ from biological rhythms. And finally, we talk about quantified self. As mentioned, Azur is very involved in quantified self and the Quantified Self Institute. We talk about how somebody could use N equals one experiments for really extracting higher levels of performance in their life. I really enjoyed this episode. It was so much fun for me. And in case you can't tell from the back and forth when you listen to it, we had a good time. The show notes for this one can be found at decodingsuperhuman.com backslash Azure. That's A-Z-U-R-E. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to my conversation with Azure Grant. Azure, welcome to the show. Thanks, Boomer. Hi, thank you for having me. You know, I'm so glad you're here. And I, I was debating on how to start this because there's so many different things I can ask you because we, we obviously have the interactions through Quantified Self. We have uh, your scientific research, of course, but also... Um, you're, you're a long distance runner, right? I am. I do like to do some long distance running. Aside from why you would subject yourself to that, do you mind just <laughs> walking through sort of what kind of marathons or, you know, longer distance runs have you done? Um, I ran cross country in high school and did sort of triathlon things through college and through that got into doing just 50 Ks. So they're technically ultra marathons, but they're really just a little bit longer than a marathon. And I live in the Bay Area. So we have Point Reyes and this really, really beautiful coastline not too far away that's sort of very hilly and very green and has some really amazing trails. So it's become sort of my favorite thing to do to sort of go and spend a day running with a small group of other people who like to subject themselves to such things. <laughs> uh, you're in good company, I imagine. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I imagine this is going to tie into today's topic. And the reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast is not only because of to discuss some of the interactions we've had at Quantified Self, but also you do a lot of research with rhythms. And most of 2018 thus far, has been a, sort of for me a theme of rhythms and awesome. I want to I wanted to pick your brain on this because obviously I'm sort of citizen scientist and you're kind of in the in the thick of it but just right. sort of if we can kick things off what exactly are biorhythms or biological rhythms yeah so biological rhythms are endogenous so internal periodic fluctions in the outputs of our bodies there were more syllables in there, but that means that these rhythms sort of occur without us doing anything. So if you put a human or 
anyone in a box, they would sort of keep going. And they allow our bodies to predict when something about the environment is likely to change. So they can be seasonal, like if you think about animals molting in the fall or spring, or like we were talking about earlier, uh, us feeling really happy when it starts to be a little lighter outside um, rather than so dark all the time. Or you can think about chickens laying eggs. These rhythms can also be circadian, which means daily. And that can be like your heart rate is up during the day and down at night. Uh, your body temperature at its core is up during the day at down at night. And those happen pretty much in every output of your body. And they can even be faster than that. So you also have sort of little pulses every few hours in many hormonal outputs of your body. So if you think about getting hungry every few hours, maybe. So those are called ultradian rhythms. And all of those rhythms sort of interact to help your body predict when it should do something, but from the hour to the day to the entire year. All right. So just on some of those ultradian rhythms, because you mentioned hunger as one. Are there, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I just want to unpack this a little bit because uh, circadian rhythm is probably the most famous one. Mm -hmm, of course. Uh, what are some of the other ultradian rhythms? Yeah. So um, talking about ultradian rhythms and things related to feeding or metabolism, ghrelin has an ultradian rhythm and its partner um, leptin has an ultradian rhythm as well. So it differs, of course, from, from person to person or between animals and people, but they're about every three to four hours. Your glucose and insulin are probably the best studied um, of the sort of metabolic related ultradian rhythms. And they sort of, they pulse sometimes every hour, sometimes every few hours. And it's not just in, in that system. It's also in, if you know, your, your stress axis, your HPA axis. Oh, it's um, one of my favorites, by the way. <laughs> it's one of our, one of our favorites and, and one of the ones that we sometimes worry the most about. But um, cortisol is, is one of these uh, outputs that has a very, very strong ultradian rhythm. I sort of like to think of it as a, uh, a multi-layered cord. So you have these little pulses going on every few hours and they sort of ride on top of this uh, overall big wave of your circadian rhythm. So even if your, your cortisol is higher during the day, it's having these little pulses on top of it that maybe aren't quite as big of a fluctuation as the entire change from day to night, but they're still significant. And we can sort of feel that when maybe we're at work and uh, we feel really motivated and are maybe getting a lot done and then sort of have a slump and need a break and then can come and back at it. That's, that's sort of even built into the physiology. All right. So you just touched on a point that I'm sure people are very interested in, in terms of just sort of work and workplace performance with bio, biological rhythms. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, or I guess the appropriate sort of question phrasing would be, why is this important for somebody to recognize the existence of these things? Uh, these, and I don't mean to demean it, uh, biological rhythms uh, mm -hmm. in everyday life because these happen automatically, but why is it important that we, we think about it? Yeah, so before I go a little bit meta, I want to say they happen automatically, but they're sort of like internal clocks that need winding from time to time. So they really listen into what else is going on in your environment. So for instance, what is referred to as the central clock in your brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN, actually is directly projected to from your retinal hypothalamic tract. Um, so it gets light input and that sort of synchronizes it every day. And similarly, clocks that are built into literally almost every cell of your body listen to different kinds of inputs that you give them. So when you're eating or when you're active or when you have a stressful event happen, all those are integrated as timing cues. So it's not like they just occur in a vacuum. They, they can also listen into what's going on. But sort of on a, on a broader level, I guess um, timing was sort of something that I thought I could outsmart for a lot of my life. Um, like <laughs> you and me both. It's, uh, <laughs> it basically describes my entire career in investment banking. But uh, go oh, ahead. Oh, my. No, I know you've you've had a history of having to fly all over the place and, and fit a lot into 24 hours. A lot into 24 hours and not enough sleep and then just adjusting time zones too many times. I basically broke most of my biological rhythms and I, I paid the price. But so I know I just I interrupted you there, Ezra. Oh, no, you're just fine. And I think we should get into that at some point. But 
I mean, sort of as you, as you take on new responsibilities and sort of, I convinced myself that I thought I could manage as much as I wanted to if I slept less or maybe ran more miles or generally just worked harder. And the awareness that I gained when I started learning about the fact that my body naturally does different things best at different times of day was sort of very freeing in the sense that it let me become a little bit more self-aware about when I felt best working and when I felt best resting. Uh, And it sort of gives one a little bit of an excuse for having time for work and time for not work. And it, it, it was very helpful in that way. So, I mean, have you, to go even more broad, uh, if you've read the the Bhagavad Gita, there's a part where, like, we've all heard Robert Robert Oppenheimer quoting, now I have become death destroyer of worlds. That quote in sort of a different translation is now I have become time destroyer of worlds. Uh, so I hadn't really appreciated that's, that's awesome. I know. <laughs> It's, it's such a central thing. And, um, and once you even learn just a little bit that a sense of time is wired into all of the organs and cells of your body, it becomes less about hacking time and more about learning to work with it. And once you learn to work with it, things sort of naturally get better. Work with time. That's something that a lot of, uh, a lot of the high performer, hard driving crowd tends to struggle with. Uh, just in general, time pressure is something that everybody kind of resonates with. I, I guess since you're into this, you're in the science, I want to mm-hmm. pick your brain about what we know about biological rhythms and more, you know, how can we use this as a tactical advantage? You touched on some of these in terms of mm-hmm. your own experience, but if you don't mind just going into what we know and maybe even what we don't know. Of course. So I think first the idea of what we know and what we don't know is really important because a lot of research has been done on biological rhythms sort of in the last 50 years, but it is still a pretty young field. And so while we know more about circadian rhythms, talking about these ultradian rhythms or seasonal rhythms or even women's ovulatory cycles are a really good example of a longer biological rhythm, a bit less is known about them. So um, though it's really important to go into the science, it's also important to use that science to sort of listen to cultural wisdom or to uh, learn what works for you and then do that. But as far as the physiology goes, so these circadian rhythms are sort of controlled by this central clock in the brain, the SCN, like we talked about. Mm -hmm. And it sends its projections to, for instance, um, parts of your hypothalamus that help regulate feeding and glucose homeostasis that help influence um, sleep and wakefulness that help regulate what body temperature you have at the core um, and that help talk to your HPA axis like we were talking about to sort of regulate uh, your, for instance, morning peak of cortisol that happens right before you wake up. And then to talk a little bit more about those fast ultradian rhythms, since those sort of regulate what we're doing hour to hour and sort of contribute to how we're feeling as we go throughout our day, they're very, they're, they've never really been um, synthetically studied. And this is part of what I'm interested in researching. But rather recently, it was observed that um, actually dopamine in your brain, so what we think of as this very motivational neuromodulator, it actually has an ultradium rhythm every few hours. Um, And at least in animals, that happens at the same time as when the animal is feeling like getting up and moving around and doing stuff versus when it's sort of sitting, hanging out, not doing very much. So there is really sort of a a direct tie between when you have higher or lower levels of different hormones in your body and, and when you feel like doing different things. To be able to know my dopamine levels on a given hour to hour, I could actually plan out my biggest, well, this could be in combination with some other rhythms, but I could plan out my biggest task for the day when I have the most motivation, right? So that's sort of like the the sci-fi version of this, right? Is if we were able to somehow be in tune with, I'll call it our ultradian phase, or even just our circadian phase, and to know when our sort of internal hormones were apt and ready to do a certain thing, that maybe we could kind of get ahead of that. Sort of, a, I guess, a simpler example of that is um, chronotype. Oh, so I love chronotype. chronotypes. I love chronotypes. We can talk all day about this. <laughs> yeah. So those, um, like that, that central clock in your brain 
most of us, uh, it doesn't run exactly at 24 hours. It'll run a little faster than 24 hours, which makes us more likely to be a morning person or a little slower, which makes us more likely to be an evening person. And there's all sort of work going on right now showing that um, everything from elementary school kids through college age people, if you're doing work sort of out of time with what your chronotype is, you you do worse in school. So for example, people who are naturally late people who have to take early classes, they, they do worse in those early classes than they would in a later class or than, than morning people in those morning classes. So even just sort of getting in tune with, with what your chronotype is and to the best of one's ability, organizing your day around that uh, can be very sort of physiologically beneficial. There's so many opportunities that come out of that in my mind. For instance, being able to restructure the workday based on the individual need, uh, which is something that I don't think corporate America and certainly, certainly corporate world is ready for, but I, I would love to see it. I would too. And I mean, I think that's that's an important point, right? Like I can talk all day about how people should have a stable routine and you should not use an alarm clock and sleep at the same time for you every day and eat at the same time for you every day. But obviously most of us live in the world and, and can't really do that. But I think even the process of taking the time to, to get to know what your biological rhythms are naturally like. So that could be if you are taking a camping trip at some point, and you can sort of get a sense of when are you naturally feeling hungry and when are you naturally waking up and, and when are you starting to feel tired, that can be very valuable. And even things like, um, like I remember I, I, I had like read a lot about sort of nutritional science and was very interested in this and got into Michael Pollan's work, et cetera. And for a long time, I had thought that I should never be hungry. Like I should eat five times a day and sort of keep ahead of hunger. Azure, but sort of Azure, into- you're, you're upsetting all of the bodybuilding world right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. It's okay. It's okay though. Because I, I've done that in the past too. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I guess more, more than for a particular, um, uh, fitness outcome, just thinking about, I would like to be aware of when my body is naturally hungry and ready to eat. And then when it's naturally full. So um, taking the time to, between meals, let myself get hungry again, sort of helped me learn more about when my body naturally wanted to eat. And I know it sounds very simple, and it's also can be difficult to implement, especially if you're eating with a partner or you only have a certain hour for lunch every day. But it's it's really helpful to sort of uh, give yourself permission that your body wants to have a temporal organization and if you listen, your body's able to, to tell you something about what that is. And even if they aren't big adjustments, sort of little adjustments over time, even if you are working in the corporate world and have set hours, they can be very helpful. And I do hope with advent of like technology, as technology keeps innovating, that people are able to take their schedule a little bit more in their own hands, mm-hmm. uh, that these these kind of things will happen, right, where we can adjust our lives to fit more of our bio, biological rhythms, excuse me. Just in general, if we disrupt these, and I'll share a little bit about my personal experience uh, after, you know, of course, after you, uh, you kind of chime in here, but what happens when we disrupt our biological rhythms? I mean, some of these larger ones, uh, circadian rhythms we've talked about, but on the sort of ultradian rhythm side, what happens when you disrupt those? So that's a really, really great question. And I think we'll be able to like understand the sort of very, uh, I guess, wide reaching answer if we think about the body as uh, a network and we think about every cell in our bodies having one of these clocks that can listen not just to to light if it's this central clock in the brain, but that are more paying attention to something like food if they're in the body. But what happens when these rhythms get disrupted, say by a jet lag or by a late night meal or by light at a time of day when it's not naturally light outside is different systems in the body adjust to that new time. So say you get light at night and the body thinks it's now six in the morning or something. When those different parts of the body adjust to the new time at different rates, communication between different parts of the body starts getting messed up. 
So think about we're on different sides of the world right now. Uh, it's 1027 in the morning for me right now. But if you had called me at 1027 in the morning for you, like I probably would have missed the call or I would have been really, really groggy on the call and not really been able to, <laughs> to say anything very cogent. Um, and it's sort of like that in your body too. So it's, it's this global idea of perturbing a network and communication just sort of getting fuzzy and not working very well in general. And so the result of that over time is not just the sort of short term, like feeling a bit nauseous, feeling very tired, that sort of stinging feeling in your eyes when you've had to get up at three in the morning to go get a flight, but it's cardiometabolic disease. So diseases that we think of um, as Western lifestyle diseases that are becoming more and more widespread, not just in the West. So things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, cancer and Alzheimer's are the, are the big ones. Risk for those all, all go up when you focus on populations that do things like shift work or people who are flight attendants. And people are still sort of deciphering the, you know, the contribution of socioeconomic status to epidemiological effects like that. But we know down to a, a very molecular level that um, when, you, when you disrupt biological rhythms, signaling between different parts of the body is perturbed. And so I guess one example that I'm very familiar with is um, chronic jet lag during pregnancy actually doesn't just affect um, the mother. It actually affects the, the outcome of the, the children. Okay. How so? Because that, that's a very interesting one to me because I know a lot of these jet setting women types. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that may be pregnant. So I'm very interested to hear how this would affect it. Yeah, of course. So um, first thing, um, getting pregnant is harder when one is chronically jet lagged. In fact, mm -hmm. if, if one is jet lagged enough, it can be very difficult to become pregnant at all. Is that just due to ovulatory cycles or is that something else? Um, so it's not fully understood, like sort of all things and many things in biological <laughs> rhythms, but it is it is true that um, ovulatory cycles are, are very disrupted by jet lag. And I think that's a great example of the fact that we think of jet lag as disturbing the 24-hour rhythm, but an ovulatory cycle is, you know, on average, about a 28-day rhythm. And so disrupting one of these rhythms really doesn't just affect that time scale. It also affects biological rhythms that may be faster or slower. Presuming that, that someone who is, um, is being jet lagged is able to get pregnant in the beginning and carry a pregnancy to term, at least in, in mice, because no systematic study in actual human women has been done on the topic. Mice who are born to moms who are chronically jet lagged have both sort of cognitive and physical deficits. They, um, they're smaller, they don't grow up to be as big, and um, they have, as far as we can tell from you know observing mouse behavior, they're sort of more fidgety, and um, and a little bit socially avoidant and sort of very detectably different from a mouse who who wasn't in a jet lagged womb while they were developing, and that that all persists into um, into adulthood. That's super interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I just I guess the key message is, is don't travel so much if you're pregnant. But it's um, it's very interesting to hear the knock on effects. Obviously, mice are different than humans, but you can make a simple. If you're able to travel less as you're pregnant, you probably have better benefits for your baby, right? Yeah, and I would say even beyond that. So, um, so these mice, this project was a very severe jet lag. It was sort of like going from New York to Paris um, every several days. So most people aren't going to be doing quite that much, um, even if they travel quite frequently. But I think the point is, um, it's not just flying in a plane that that contributes to this kind of circadian disruption that can impair development, but it's it's things like uh, that desynchronization between different parts of the body that we talked about. So maybe looking at your phone a lot at night tells that central clock in your brain that it's morning time and the rest of your body doesn't get that cue, or eating late dinners at work sort of tells the inside of your body, maybe your liver, that it's a different time, it's daytime and time for eating, while the rest of your body thinks it's night. It's sort of, it's, it's a very, very widespread phenomenon, this sort of social jet lag, in addition to just the real jet lag. Yeah, social jet lag's interesting, right? Because you can just have these people who go out on the weekends, as all sort of younger people do, go out on the weekends and then wake up at completely different times, maybe sleep until the afternoon, and then come Monday or come Sunday night when you have to go back to work, it's very hard to get to sleep, right? Exactly. And I 
I think that's a really important point because I mean, we're cultural people, right? Like we, we tend to think if, um, if everybody around us is doing something that that must be sort of at least similar to, to how it's supposed to be done. And I think the, the realization that how a lot of us live now, um, it, it's not physiologically normal to be doing things at all different times of day. And until sort of the, the last couple of generations when we start getting, you know, electric light and um, industrialization of food, making food much more readily available at all times of day, people didn't live like this. So this is, this is all very new and we're all sort of guinea pigs for what is this kind of lifestyle due to the human body. And the result of the experiment so far is that when you do this kind of disruption frequently, you see all of these diseases, the cardiometabolic, the cognitive illness, um, and even poor performance in school, um, you see those things accelerating. And while we can't all and don't want to all go back to like, you know, pastoralism of living without light and turning our own butter and such. Um. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually <laughs> wouldn't mind that a couple of days, a, a couple of days a month. That would be kind of fun. It's a good arm workout. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the point is to to sort of be aware that this is not normal. And while we we're not going to go back to a pre-industrial society, uh, if we can make sort of little shifts to be aware of our body's internal rhythms and what you want to be doing at different times of day, and then try to live more in tune with that, it really physiologically uh, will help you. Just as an aside on my own story, because I know Azura, mm-hmm. I've shared this with you before, but I was one of those people that you met and mentioned is sort of that chronically jet lagged type. Um, and frankly, yeah, I, I saw the result of this. I was going to Europe 12 times a year from Singapore, the United States, wow. five to 10 times a year. And you know, at the end, I did have one of those well, cardiovascular disease happen to me at a very young age. And so one of the, the first things that I addressed and one of the things that I've you know, now become obsessed with is this, my biological rhythms, because I saw the full on effect of disrupting those. And it's in a way been very life changing. So thank you for sharing all of that. No, can I just ask you, because I would like to hear a little bit more about it, just as you're comfortable in sharing, what do you do differently now? I am an open kimono, by the way. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So what do I do differently now? Uh, Very good question. So if you look at my life back then, for one, I changed jobs. So I went to work for myself to basically construct a life that I had more control over. And so what do I do differently now? My my day to day, I basically wake up at the same time, I go to bed, plus or minus 15 minutes, uh, maybe 30 minutes on a different day at the same time. And I, I seek to really get outside first thing in the morning. It's Amsterdam. So uh-huh. if, uh, if I'm lucky, there's sunlight, but I'll still seek to get outside and maybe do a little bit of grounding and just sort of really entrain that into to my body. At night, you mentioned cell phones, blue light, et cetera. As a person who loves technology, it's very mm-hmm. hard to put that down. But there are different devices, different applications out there that can help you block blue light. And so Uh I I fully utilize all of those, including the really nerdy blue light blockers. Uh, (laughs) and, Uh And I guess on top of that, I even dug fully on into some of the books out there like Michael Bruce's When or Power of When. And then uh, Daniel Pink just came out with a book, I think, called When. And Uh just sort of looking to listen to my body as to when I should work out during the day and really trying to optimize those times based on what I'm trying to do. So in a way, I've I've become obsessed with rhythms. (laughs) (laughs) That's really amazing that you've become so aware. That's great. And has it, and you feeling better and this has made an impact on you? Massively. So in terms of just day-to-day energy, day-to-day motivations, so much better than what it used to be. You know, there you mentioned social jet lag. Uh, I used mm-hmm. to have that in a big way because I was changing time zones so much, but also because of how my my social life worked. I do think for people that do have, look, we're social beings and sometimes I do stay up later than I would like, but, mm-hmm. you know, waking up at the same time the next day does help to get back in sort of that rhythm. But mm-hmm. it's 
really impacted me in a, a very positive way. That's really, really cool. I mean, you're such, you're almost a poster child for uh, going from circadian disruption to, to this more sort of pastoral in tune with your body lifestyle, it seems like. <laughs> it, it's, uh, you know, when you said churning butter, I would love to do it, but it, it's it's <laughs> not, not quite on my, my task list for tomorrow, but I, either. if there was ever somebody who needed a billboard of, you know, circadian rhythm or circadian uh, disorders and the benefits of listening to your rhythms, I'm happy to volunteer. <laughs> That's for sure. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. So I, I just, one one word you mentioned earlier that is really interesting to me is this, uh, you know, temporal organization. Because mm-hmm. a lot of the books that I read, and granted, you know, I, I do read the science as well, but I, temporal structures are mm-hmm. a little unfamiliar to me. And I, I just wanted to kind of, if I could double click on that for a little bit and, and just yeah. ask you sort of what are the differences between you know temporal structures and biological rhythms so i think it's a it's a bit of a semantic thing and sometimes we use them interchangeably but a temporal structure is sort of what it it sounds like it's a it's a pattern in time and it's a general term so what biological rhythms you can think of them as your body encoding a temporal structure into the physical molecules the physical stuff that makes us up So biological rhythms are the result of every cell in our body encoding temporal structure into its DNA. So that's, I think that's the, maybe the easiest way to think about it. Okay. So biological rhythms are like, if I have an outline, they're the top of the pyramid and everything working underneath it is the, is the temporal structure. Is that right? I would sort of just say um, the temporal structure is a descriptive term to explain sort of what the biological rhythm looks like. So I could talk about maybe a sinusoidal temporal structure. So uh, our circadian rhythms, you know, a a sinusoid, sort of like a a very smooth up and down wave. So a circadian rhythm in something like body temperature at, at its core sort of looks like a sinusoid, whereas the temporal structure of an ultradian rhythm might look more like a sawtooth, so sort of a a sharp spike and then a a quick decay after that. So a temporal structure is really sort of just the descriptive term for what does a time structure look like? And you could apply temporal structure to talking about the temporal structure of birdsong or of a, a musical score. So a biological rhythm really sort of pins it down to we're talking about physiology rather than a temporal structure explains sort of how an output of any kind is organized in time. Okay. I think you answered my next question as well, but uh, that, that's awesome. Do you mind if we switch topics just a second to talk a little bit about quantified self? Of course. Because this is something that, this is how I came to meet you, but yeah. how did you become interested in quantified self? Because obviously you're, you're the ultra marathoner, you're into biological rhythm, so that that's probably part of it. But, mm-hmm. you know, how did you discover quantified self? So... I came to quantified self really as a direct result of um, research that I was doing in the lab that was in in mouse models. And some of the things that I was studying were were outputs like body temperature. And I thought, hey, like, I know we we, we turn to mouse models to, to study things in a very detailed and molecular way in a controlled system, but body temperature, that's that's something that I could do on myself. And I was interested if any of the results that I was seeing in particular, part of the work was looking at the structure in time in body temperature of ovulatory cycles, as well as these these jet lag structures. Um, we were looking at them using body temperature, and I thought I should be able to, to do that in a real person and see if anything that I'm finding holds true in a human. I started wearing these body temperature sensors to take my temperature every minute, sort of wear them on my wrist, wear them on my rib cage. What sensors, if you don't mind me asking, because I know there may be somebody, including myself, who may want to just try this afterwards. Oh, of course. I would love that. This is my sort of uh, pet citizen science project. Um, but they're they're called Thermocron eye buttons. And they I actually have a blog post about this on Quantified Self and a talk from the Quantified Self Amsterdam conference last year that that talks a bit about this and gives the details if anyone is interested. And just on that, I'll link to all of this in the show notes, which are at decodingsuperhuman.com backslash Azure. That's A-Z-U-R-E. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. But so I, 
I started, that's just one example, but I started sort of wearing the sensor on myself to see if I could see the same sort of structures and, and lo and behold, I could and started learning a lot about myself. But um, we also had been doing collaborations with engineering groups, um, both at, at Berkeley and at San Diego, and had access to some really neat tools like this, uh, for instance, it's a, we call it the gut rig, but it's an electrode away, array that you can wear on your stomach or also put the electrodes on your forehead. And then you can see um, in real time output over 24 or 48 hours, what is your stomach activity doing? And the stomach is one of these things that has both ultradian rhythms. So every few hours it has this series of contractions, but also um, shows a circadian rhythm and activity. And you could sort of compare that with what is your what is your brain doing? Can we learn something about your sleep staging at the same time? And so sort of getting into this world of what is the engineering side of trying to understand biology and I'm testing these devices on myself because they're they're still being developed in the lab and they're not commercially available. That brought me towards quantified self. And uh, it was my sort of my first uh the first place that I, I knew I wanted to work to to do something more citizen science related. Just on that gut rig, is this the same gut rig that Ben used uh, to come out with his recent research paper? Yeah, so this has actually been getting a lot of press recently um, because this was actually used to help track Larry Smarr's recovery from a surgery. And it's a, it's a really, really interesting story and it's actually starting to be used more widely. I believe uh, Dana Lewis, the sort of pioneer of the closed loop pancreas system, DIYPS, I think she's actually beginning to, to work with the system as well, because in diabetes, uh, digestion is also can be hugely impacted in a negative way, but no one really knows anything about that. So um, at least at, at a very high temporal resolution of continuously monitoring gut activity. So it's, it's really blown up and it's really cool. Yeah, it's very interesting to read. And I, of course, have so many different questions about the broader implications of this, uh, yeah. but I, I'm going to drill Ben on that at some point in, in the near future. And just for everybody, that's Benjamin Smarr. He was a, a guest on the podcast as well. But uh, is there, in terms of your self-quantification experience, what's been some of the most interesting things that you've learned about yourself? Yeah. So I guess I'll just focus briefly on the body temperature stuff. The reason that I started that project was because I had been on hormonal birth control for years, sort of on and off. And so I hadn't really had a stable ovulatory cycle or even much of an ovulatory cycle at all for years. And I knew this was an output that, in, at least in the mice, I could see ovulatory cycles very, very clearly and see when they were disrupted. What I learned first was that when I stopped taking hormonal birth control, it took me about a year to come back to having a quote unquote normal looking body temperature ovulatory cycle. So that was really, really interesting for me. I had no idea that sort of the recovery from having taken these weird static dose hormone implants for so long would, would take me so long. So that's been really interesting and sort of motivated me to, to grow the project. I also sort of on a jet lag side learned that um, when, uh, when I jet lag myself, so when I travel anywhere, even if it's just a, a few time zones, my body temperature rhythm gets much weaker. So if you think about how much change there is from peak to trough of, of the circadian rhythm, it gets very, very weak and sort of very, very shallow when I'm first crossing time zones and traveling and sort of experiencing jet lag. And then often it will, it will not come back up to full strength until I'm back home again, even if I've sort of accustomed to a new time zone for, for many days. So I thought that was interesting. It was a little bit different than what you hear about. Uh, you can adapt to one time zone a day. So I'm very curious and I'm starting to study with a, a larger group of people. Some people maybe are fast adapters to jet lag and some people are maybe more slow adapters and it's been really fun. That's that's really interesting, particularly the jet lag thing. I'm always fascinated about anybody who studies jet lag. So it's very, very interesting. And thank you for sharing the ovulatory cycles point. What do you think the broader implications are of this kind of N equals one experimentation on not just human performance, but also healthcare? And I guess you can touch on some of the things that we, you and I have worked together recently. So Boomer, you were part of this project with me um, and Quantified Self called Blood Testers, where we were trying to find out what we could learn 
by measuring blood lipids, so cholesterol and triglycerides, which are big risk factors for cardiovascular disease, um, what happens when we measure them very frequently? And can we, can we learn something about ourselves from, from that? And a couple of the big findings from that were, first, that um, people show daily change in um, in cholesterol and triglycerides that has sort of the, the shape and phase of what we would expect for that circadian rhythm. And that like sort of big surprise, everybody was a little bit different. Um, so that was very interesting. But we also learned that people can cross risk categories for cardiovascular disease from morning to morning at about the same time in the fasted state. And so this really made us question whether a single measurement at the doctor's office that we would normally get once a year for these risk factors is really telling us um, as much information as we would like about what our risk is for a certain disease. And, and it's brought up all these questions about how does that fit into the decision to, um, to give someone a statin or, or to take some sort of other medical action. So I think this sort of uh, illustrates in a very small way the power of people starting to question sort of norms about uh, what can we really learn from uh, epidemiological studies about ourselves? We normally think like we should sleep eight hours a night because that's the mean amount of sleep a, we think a human needs. But N of one um, allows you to, even if without experimenting, to observe and to understand how you might deviate from the mean. That's awesome. And very well put, by the way, because my one of my big takeaways was how can we as you know, how could a physician, and I don't mean to criticize the physician, this is how they're taught, but how could someone take one lab result at one point during the year and then make a determination to put somebody on a stat in the rest of their life when I saw my cholesterol vary by almost 25% throughout the day? And it was, uh, it's pretty crazy and pretty interesting to see. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I mean, I think the one of the take homes is really that a lot of medical decisions are are made based on epidemiological data in part because that's all that was available for a long time. And we're really just getting into this era where you can have so, so, so much more information about a single person. And it's going to take a long time to sort of steer that aircraft carrier even a few degrees um, away from where it is right now and to... Um, to sort of implement these things and make them easy to implement at the medical level when a doctor is, has maybe like 300 patients on their roster. So it's, it's really an impetus for every person to take on the, uh, the task of learning more about their own physiology with these sort of very easy to measure outputs, um, to ask what that means and to use yourself um, over time as a sort of dynamic baseline rather than the national average do a reference range of yourself, right? And instead of looking at the reference range of some lab companies, uh, you know, test, et cetera. Exactly. So one could even think of one's baseline of something like, like blood glucose as not just your one morning fasting blood glucose, but you could think about your baseline as being what is the range of glucose that you go through throughout a day and what does that sinusoid look like? And that could really be your more dynamic baseline that, that carries a lot more information than just that single time point. Is there, I know you're a little bit limited on time, and I, I don't want to take too much of it, um, but I want to just wrap up with a few more questions. In terms of just, if somebody's interested in reading more about these biological rhythms and temporal structures, mm -hmm. what types of books or what, what books do you recommend or websites? Um. So I, I was thinking about this, and I want to say something that might be a little bit cringy when you first hear it, but um, I really recommend going straight to websites of universities and straight to straight to PubMed. So universities like uh, UC San Diego or the Harvard Sleep Group or um, Northwestern and U Chicago are really big um, sort of epicenters for biological rhythms research. And you can go straight to PubMed and where things are freely available, a lot of them are sort of having a push to do open access. You can type in a set of keywords or a specific question and really come face to face with what the actual scientific knowledge is. 
even though it's a bit harder to read, or the websites of schools will put out press releases about, about new research that happens. But the reason to, I think, to go directly to the literature is even if it's, you know, sort of written in scientific lingo and takes maybe some extra effort to, to Google around and learn what some of the words mean, it brings you up against the fact that it's really, really not a complete story, that we learn little tidbits and are able to to build a story along the way, but a lot gets lost in translation in um, in pop science or even in some sort of scientific articles that are written more for the general public. So I think it's a really good exercise. It doesn't have to take a long time, but I would I would definitely do that and just sort of focus on research groups that that are putting out interesting works like the ones I mentioned. When you first said cringe, I, I thought you were going to say BuzzFeed or something like that, but I'm really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad Opposite. you ran down the, uh, the route you did because I, I completely agree with you. Going right to the source is the best way to go always. Yeah. And then final three questions I ask everyone. The first one, what is the top tool or technology that you use to become more superhuman. All right, so I have a bit of a silly answer for this one too, but um, I love the app Headspace. Uh, I've been using it for a few months now, and it's what it does is it's sort of a, a set of recorded, like uh, I guess, self awareness or breathing exercises that are very stereotyped and very uh, very sort of simple simplified. But in in terms of the theme of sort of becoming more self aware and learning how to listen to the cues that your body is giving you over the course of the day. Uh, that's been hugely helpful for, to me. So I love that as sort of a tool that I go to every day. Great way to learn how to meditate as well. What's the top tool, technique, or recommendation you have for people who want to improve their cognition? To improve their cognition, I would say this is a very general one as well, but I think the best thing you can do is find someone in your life that you enjoy talking to someone that you're very close with and try to have daily conversations with them about things that are challenging to you or things that you're learning. So if you do go and look up a paper and it's sort of hard to understand or there's a lot of jargon in it or you are just sort of thinking about changes that you're making in your life, I think engaging with another person on a regular basis and asking questions that you don't know the answer to I think having that dialogue is sort of the, the best way to work through problems. And it's probably the thing that's helped me most um, to work through my own thoughts. That's a great recommendation because I know when I struggle with something, sometimes I do the exact opposite of that. And I just try and dive through a wormhole and figure it out myself. Whereas if you're talking with another person, maybe their idea comes out of left field, but you may be able to resolve it a lot faster and just move on. And, you know, that, that's very helpful, right? Right. And I mean, it sounds sort of like a dumb idea. Like, what do you do to make yourself smarter? Go talk to your partner or your friends or something. But um, it is easy to sort of socially isolate yourself and, and think that you should go to Google instead of go to a human. But um, you can't say too much about the value of human to human communication, I think. Yeah, we're getting a lot into evolutionary biology there, right? Um, <laughs> but last question, what's the mm -hmm. best book you have read on peak performance? And now I have to caveat this question and say that people have gone a number of different ways with this, but what's the best book you've read? I think I would say uh, In Defense of Food by Michael Pollan. <laughs> It's not exactly a book about increasing performance at all, but um, but, but it is a but book nutrition about is so related to performance, so it's good. Yeah, it's almost sort of anti-nutritionism. It's a book that makes you think about why you assume that you should eat what you're eating, and makes you question sort of from a political and a social and a cultural, and even and a scientific context, where do food habits come from, and um, and why do we believe what we believe sort of just on a cultural gestalt level? And I think it sort of more broadly makes a good case for how much we know scientifically and how much we don't know scientifically and really makes that case for, for the value of self-awareness, even in what feels like a crazily technologically enabled world. That is such a great way to end. Uh, is there... Where can people find more about you? Uh, let's see. Uh, probably the, the Quantified Self website or look me up on PubMed and some of the things that I've done will be there as well. We'll link, of course, to all of this in the show notes, but it's been so fun talking to you. I, I always learn a lot when I'm on the phone with you. So thank you <laughs> once again for joining us and sharing all this wisdom. I have so many notes that 
I've taken and I always learn a lot, but thank you. Thank you so much, Boomer. It's been a pleasure to work with you on blood testers and I always love talking to you um, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, that's right. We'll see each other in San Diego. Take care. All right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in once again to the Decoding Superhuman podcast. I really value your feedback, so a couple of things. If you can go over to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a five-star review, it would mean the world to me. And then two, would love to hear from you. What topics, what people, what things do you want us to cover on this podcast? If you can send an email to podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com, I read them all, and I would love to have your feedback. Have an epic day.